It's a genuine pleasure to um, welcome Jonathan Neal to Wilsdon, and uh, he's the lead author of the pamphlet One Million Climate Jobs, and uh, wrote this book, I think, a few years just before the pamphlet, but they're intertwined. He's going to talk for half an hour. Um, we have to be out here at nine, but there's plenty of time for discussion, and um, over to you, John. Okay. So this is a series of talks by environmental writers. I'm going to talk both about writing and about the environment. And I'm going to start with the writing. I'm going to start with how I wrote this book and what I was trying to do and the problems I encountered in doing it. Um, I've been a writer, professional writer, for 30 years. And I've written a lot of different kinds of things. Um, plays mainly for young people, novels mainly for adults, and history and politics for adults, nonfiction. And But it, what's held all of those kinds of writing together was that I wrote stories. Uh, the, the politics and the history, they were also stories. And in 2004, after a lot of time spent in the... Um, writing a couple of children's novels and a lot of time spent in the anti-capitalist movement and the Genoa Social Forum, the European Social Forum, I came home and said to my family, okay, what am I going to write next? And my son, Ruard, and my partner, Nancy, both said... Um, you're going to write something on climate change, Jonathan. Uh, it's the most important thing facing the world. So I thought I'd see. And I went and I got active in the campaign against climate change and went along to the meetings and started, uh, started doing stuff there with an idea that I'd write a story, rather like the stories I'd written before, but about climate change and about the struggle to, to do something about it. But that changed and it changed in the process of doing the research for the book. In doing the research for the book, I read a lot on the science of climate change. And there came a point where I understood what was involved, what was likely to be the actual effects. I not only understood in a general sense, because I read a list of the effects, I understood the scientific processes involved, and therefore why it was going to happen. And that had two effects. And the first one was that I had a lot of trouble sleeping for months. I had a recurring dream that I was trying to tell lots of people that something terribly wrong was happening and that no one was listening to me. The common climate activist anxiety dream. Um, and the other, but the other thing was that the kind of book I wanted to write had to change. Because what I understood I needed to write, once I understood how serious the problem was, and once I'd been involved in the movement for some time, I understood that we needed, we needed two things that I could do in the book. Um, one was a Marxist understanding of the politics of climate change. Two, three. A Marxist understanding of the politics of climate change, a an answer to the question, how can we stop climate change, um, was the second. And we needed that answer because it was clear that the environmental movement was at an impasse. The environmental movement um, had started out in the, in the modern one, it started out in the 1970s with the idea that if you told everybody what was wrong with the environment, then you would persuade the majority of people, and then in a democratic country, people would vote to change it. And also you could persuade the people at, top, at the top who would see the logic of what you were saying and would change it. So it was based on publicity making things clear and on lobbying people at the top. It was Environmentalism started to go into a kind of crisis in the late 80s, early 90s because this model wasn't working. Climate change activism was going into a crisis in the about 2003, 2004, 2005 because the driving people in doing something about climate were the climate scientists, actually, not the environmentalists. And they were quite <coughs> conventional people in many ways in their social outlook, and they too had thought that by telling the whole world they could change things, and it wasn't working. So we needed a solution what to do about it. That's why a Marxist approach was important because Marxists 
have the only analysis really around from the point of view of opposition to the way things are about how to change the world. <laughs> um, um, the detailed analysis of how the system works and so on. Whatever you think of Marxist in practice, it's the main body of thought devoted to that. I had an, so I set out to write a Marxist understanding of capitalism, which didn't really wasn't a, would work as an argument, but didn't work as a story uh, of capitalism and climate change. I had I had more than one reason to do that. I was also doing that because I. I wanted to get the left more involved in climate politics. And I thought, explain it to the left in the words and the concepts that they understand, <laughs> make sense of how activism would work and what's involved in terms that they understand, and it will get the left much more involved. But also, we have to crack this problem of what do we do. And I took, really, um, now, before I would, what ideas I took, in writing this, um, it's much the most difficult book I've ever written. It was deeply, frustratingly hard work mm. for two reasons. One of which is to make sense of climate change, of the politics of climate change, you have to understand a lot of things. You have to understand the politics, you have to understand how the capitalist world economy works, and you have to understand the science and the engineering. You have to really understand them. So I was busy buying books called Chemistry for Idiots and Physics for Idiots and so on and reading up on the bits I didn't know. And an awful lot of what's written on climate change is, is weakened because the, the, the writer doesn't really bother to learn to understand the bits he doesn't understand going in. So that made it much harder. But also I was trying to think about things that people like me hadn't thought about. Um, the computer right. training center and yeah, internet just facilities just are now closed. Yeah. If you wish to borrow or return any items, can they make your way to the counter or simply shut down your downstairs? Please yeah. note that the library yeah. will be closing in 15 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I am. Um, so it took a long time to write, and also I guess the third problem was it's a problem in all climate change writing, a tendency towards hysteria and ranting, and then I'd have to go back and take out the hysteria and the personal attacks on the people I disagreed with and the apocalyptic imagery and so on, uh, because it doesn't help anybody. So all of that, all of that made, it, made it work. And also, I had to explain all the technical bits in language that people could understand, because I knew that everybody reading it would, might understand some of the bits, but the other bits would be like complete news to them. Um, so, uh, so also had to work at the writing. And what I did was I took, I took three, what for me were the three central ideas of Marxism and tried to apply them. And the first one is to look at the problem. Look at the problem people are facing and the solutions. Don't start with questions like, what is the relationship between capitalism and the environment? Don't start with those kind of abstract questions. Start with the problem that's in front of you and how do you need to solve it. And with climate change, you work it through and that's pretty clear. The problem with climate change is that we have to cut carbon, other greenhouse gases as well, but fundamentally, the basic one, carbon dioxide, we have to cut emissions by between 50 and 60% globally. The, carbon sinks absorb the rest, the oceans and the plants and the trees. We have to cut between 50 and 60 percent globally. That means in the rich countries, 80 percent of carbon dioxide. We have to do it in about 20 years or less um, because time is ticking. Um, but in order to avoid abrupt climate change, runaway climate change of the kind that has happened in the past when the, when the world was warming and that would be catastrophic. Um, so we need deep cuts. We need them quite quickly. And, the and there, are three, there are thousands of things we need to do, but three are central. Um, one is to cover the world with renewable energy, mainly sun and wind power, so that uh, all the electricity we use comes from renewable energy, but also so that renewable energy replaces oil in transportation, and so that new renewable energy replaces 
heating oil and get gas and coal in heating homes and buildings. Those are the main things we need to do. Um, and at the same time, to reduce the amount, the sheer amount of energy we have to use by using energy more efficiently. We cannot, given the scale of it, we cannot do this by cutting consumption. Um, you could perhaps cut consumption by 40% in, um, in a country like Britain, if you could get anybody to agree to do it. But the idea of 80% cuts in, cons in personal consumption, for almost everybody in this room, an 80% cut in personal consumption, uh, you lose transport, um, you still eat, but on top of eating, you've got a choice between food and sh between clothing and shelter. <laughs> um, and that's it. <laughs> Everything else is gone. That's, that, that's the case. Uh, cuts on that scale, you cannot simply, you cannot do it by cutting consumption. So we have to do it utterly differently. We have to, uh, we have to produce energy differently by renewable energy. That is, that's, and that solution in a sense has nothing to do with Marxism or capitalism. <laughs> in any, in whatever social and economic system you might imagine, that's what we're going to have to do. Because that is the nature of the problem. Okay, now you look at that, and then the second thing is you look at capitalism. In terms of why this hasn't happened already, because all the problems that can be, it's not that capitalism can't solve problems. There are many problems that capitalism can solve. Smallpox is one. There are many others. All the problems that can be easily solved within capitalism have been solved within capitalism. <laughs> the ones we're left with are the ones it's difficult to solve within capitalism. And, but capitalism isn't an abstract system and it's not an evil person. And capitalism didn't set out to make climate change. Uh, <laughs> that's not what happened. You have to, you have, capitalism is a complex, complex economic and political system. And yet you have to look at the different, you have to look at the different kinds of politics you can see and look at in, in climate politics and look at their roots in the capitalist system. And really there's three problems. The first is um, some corporations, the corporations who would lose out in a shift to a low carbon world. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the automobile corporations, the oil corporations, and the coal corporations. Um, uh, critically, uh, those are very important corporations. And people keep saying, well, couldn't Shell you know, couldn't they switch over to renewable energy? The fact is that when capitalism changes technologically, the old corporation loses out and is replaced by a new one. The car corporations are not the same as the railway corporations. My, IBM controlled the old big computers, small computers came in and software, it was Microsoft, and so on. A change doesn't mean that capitalism will die, but it means that some existing corporations will die, and therefore they fight it to the end. Critically, these are very important corporations. Of the ten largest corporations by sales globally in the moment, um, eight are either oil companies or car companies, and the largest of all is Walmart, which depends on cars and parking lots. Um, that's an enormous concentration of corporate power. And they